Next session, um, we are talking of trends in uh, New Age terrorism. And uh, you would have noticed that what terrorism appeared, say, 30 to 50 years ago, was different to what it appeared just two decades back. It is different today and the rest of the program. Uh, may, I request, may I request you, sir, for your address, please? What the biggest menace the modern world is facing today, that is the threat of terrorism. Discussing, deliberating, debating, and also preparing a strategy for counter-terrorism. I know there are two elements, key elements. One, to fight terrorists, we need certain arms, ammunition, technology, and everything else, so that we can neutralize the terrorist activity. But the other more important thing is the ideology which gives rise to terrorism, how do you fight it together? And that's a very important element, the key element into fighting terrorism. If you go into the Middle East, the countries are really affected by terrorism and therefore they are now themselves rising against terrorism. There are countries which believe in any religion, all religions, they are uniting to fight terrorism. So therefore, terrorism is something which is, has to be isolated from that ideology which is nothing to do with religion. This is an ideology of making, disrupting the life, that's the ideology and there is nothing religious about it. I don't think any religion in the world would say that you try to go and kill the fellow citizen. And therefore, ideology, which is the root cause of terrorism and deliberately being confused with a religion should be properly isolated, identified, and we must all fight it together. And to do that, India is the right place because we have almost all religions of the world and most of the major religions of the world even originated in India. Or not originated but now practiced in India. And therefore, I would feel that we must ensure that India would be the place wherein we are victims of terrorism at the same time we feel that we should run a fight against terrorism. And therefore this conference organized all the leading countries of the world and the leading experts who are themselves fighting terrorism are here and therefore we must prepare a strategy. What the key effect of terrorism over a period of time will feel is a decrease in economic activity which is what terrorism would also like to achieve. I am already seeing as a Commerce Minister of India that global trade is under serious threat. The global trade is under serious threat because of so many other reasons. The people are confusing the WTO with the idea of that it creates barriers and it creates a fundamental flow of goods and services from one country to another. In fact, we strongly believe that global trade is necessary to promote more economic activity so that poverty can be reduced, developing countries can benefit, and therefore global trade is necessary. But global trade is itself under threat and will be under threat if we do not address terrorism properly. And therefore terrorism has to be identified as a great threat to global trade. And those threats that were posed today by some countries raising unnecessary issues, we can deal, deal with them properly. Incidentally, to deal with them on 19th and 20th, just three days from now, India is convening a mini ministerial of 50 countries, ministers from and the officials and the ambassadors from 50 countries will be here to ensure that we pursue the path of open trade, global trade, globalization, so that each of us get connected. The connectivity that has come through globalization has brought humanity together. 7.3 billion people now can interact with each other, talk to each other, work together, share ideas with each other, thanks to technology, but also thanks to the promotion of idea of globalization and global trade itself. And therefore, a Prime Minister, when he was in Davos, he very clearly and unequivocally, unambiguously said that we want to have a free trade, open trade, and therefore we are pursuing that path. But the pursuance of this path itself will be threatened by some terrorist activity which will ensure that we disrupt this global trade. So therefore, we must work on terrorism and as an anti-terrorist activity, even to ensure a bigger objective of ensuring that we all benefit 
from the activity that has been pursued for so many years in which all countries are participating and that should be pursued. The second element, and that's my another response in the government, is aviation. And the Prime Minister has asked me to look at it very recently. That's another tool or the other victim of terrorist activity will be the aviation sector. And therefore, we are trying to work with all the global community to find out how we can have best practices shared globally so that we do not allow the terrorists to work on the design, nefarious design, to disrupt the air traffic in some form. So we, as India, are really trying to take a number of steps so that we pursue the path of progress, prosperity for all by ensuring that no extraneous activity will create a hurdle in that manner. And therefore, terrorism is certainly an extraneous activity. But luckily, while we say it is an activity, there has been a very good part of that, and that's a good sign of that, is all countries have now realized that we must fight terrorism. Some of the countries are trying to do it with their own efforts, with their own resources available with them, and therefore they are trying to achieve their own target. But just imagine, terrorism, the origin of terrorism, maybe in some other country, the manifestation may happen in some other country. For example, some of the terrorist attacks that take place in India, the motivation, the origination, the entire planning, the strategy does not happen on Indian soil. So unless we fight terrorism together, we will not be able to achieve the results. And therefore, rather than fighting individually, we must all fight it collectively. And that's why this important issue of counter-terrorism conference, which I hope eventually will lead to have a counter-terrorism front. A global activity, global front, global organization which will like to fight terrorism together. And all of us then will benefit from it. In fact, this should not be against a particular sect, particular religion, particular thing, but against terrorism, against terrorists, against those who are trying to threaten the entire global order of the world. And therefore, we must all fight against it, try to work together. And therefore, I'm very happy that you are all here. I'm, I'm just here to lend my full support as a minister in the government of India, but also in my individual capacity, and also one of the directors of India Foundation, which we all feel very strongly that India Foundation stands for creating global peace, global prosperity, global happiness, and through various events, this idea is perpetuated, idea is transmitted. So I think this is one of the pillars of India Foundation, is to fight global terrorism, but not the only platform, only objective of India Foundation, but this becomes part of our overall foundation because we realize to pursue peace, pursue global prosperity, bring in economic development, terrorism will be a threat to that. And therefore, this conference has been organized. I wish you, all of those who are here, welcome to India. Participate and thanks for participating in this conference. And I really offer you all my sincere best wishes for succeeding in this common endeavor of making the world a far better place than what it is today. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for the very informative speech. As the minister has to leave, I request the chair to please felicitate the Honorable Minister. Thank you. Uh, may I request all of you to give a very warm uh, round of applause to the Honorable Minister. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue with the session. And, uh, it'll come in, right? Uh, um, now, may I request uh, Ms. Anne Speckard for her presentation, please. Hello. Uh, thank you to the India Foundation, and it's good to be back with many of you, familiar faces. 
I'd like to say right from the outset, I'm listed as coming from the UK, but I'm really from the US. And uh, I only have a short time to tell you what we're working on at the International Center for the Study of Violent Extremism. But for the past 20 years, I'm a psychologist. I've been interviewing terrorists, about 600 of them, and looking at their trajectories into and back out of terrorism. Uh, thirdly, there's an ideology. And fourth, there's something inside the individual that resonates to the first three. And you can fight terrorism in many ways. In our particular group, we've decided to look at uh, counter-narratives. And in the last year, we went and interviewed ISIS cadres. We've interviewed them around the world. Some of them were defectors. Some of them were returnees from the battleground. As you know, there were 40,000 foreign fighters from over 100 countries that joined Islamic State. And uh, some of them were in prisons in uh, Baghdad, in uh, uh, Suleimania. And at this point, we've interviewed 77 of them. It might be 78, I lose track. And uh, what we do is we sit down, we make a very in-depth interview. We ask them uh, who they were before they joined the terrorist group. Uh, what attracted them to the group, how they heard about it. And as one of our previous speakers, I think it was Mr. Dorsey told us, Islamic State is selling a dream. So they're selling an alternative uh, form of world governance, uh, an answer to alienation, marginalization, injustice, indignity. And uh, so how did they get attracted into this dream? What did they believe about it? How did they join? How did they find the contact to get in? How did they travel if they traveled? Uh, once they got there, did they go through Sharia training? A lot of them that uh, joined in Syria after Islamic State declared its caliphate told us that when they finished Sharia training, they were brought around. That was One woman told us about biting with metal teeth punishing other women by um, biting them on fleshy parts of their body. Um, uh, if they were children, if they were in the cubs of the caliphate, whatever their particular experiences were. Then we moved to what did they not like about Islamic State? What were they disappointed in? And nearly all did, how did they defect? How did they get out? Some of the people that we've been interviewing in Baghdad recently tell us, well, there's no advice about joining Islamic State. Islamic State is defeated. And our answer is, well, there's still people joining. We recently had attacks in New York from two people that were reading on the internet thinking that perhaps they're helping the people in Iraq. Um, what's their advice to these people? Is it helping? Should they join? What's the advice to a young kid in Molenbeek? Should he join? What's the advice to the people in their own country? Should they join? And at this point, many people give very strong denunciations of the group. And um, I should say we're video recording all of this. Um, then we also ask in Baghdad, most of the ISIS cadres, unless they were kids when they went in, uh, receive a death sentence. So they're facing uh, that they're gonna be hung. And we ask them, because they at least for a while, most of them were true believers, we ask them, how's it going to be when you uh, face Allah? How do you feel about that? What, what's going to happen? And at that moment, we get some very true words about how they're afraid, how they beg Allah for forgiveness. We talked to a rapist, a guy that raped 50 women. At first, he sounded proud of it. He talked about how he went to a home where they were keeping these Yazidi women and uh, routinely raped them. We asked him in detail about it. And he said, you know, I had to hit them to subdue, subdue them. One woman he didn't have to fight with and he thought she liked him while he was raping her. Can you imagine? It was a very pathetic story and a pathetic man. But at the end when we asked this question, he suddenly um, uh, expressed deep remorse and uh, opened up about it. We interviewed an ISIS emir that showed no remorse whatsoever, was very proud and sure of the ideology. And 
in the interview, we showed him one of our counter narratives because it was so chilling listening to him. I suddenly said, can I show you somebody who disagrees with you that I've got on video? And he watched it intently and suddenly hung his head in shame and said, you know what? We had debates about this inside the organization. We were wrong. You know, of course this didn't you know, change him and uh, rehabilitate him that we can let him go, but it also showed the power of what we're doing. So I can talk and talk about this, and I'll just tell you a few things, but then I want to show you a counter-narrative because I know my time is short. And um, you can go on YouTube, you can look at all of them. So far out of the 78 interviews, we've managed to make 18 counter-narrative videos. Um, we're, um, we've just received uh, funding, and we're um, going into our next phase where we hope to put it on steroids and have uh, hundreds of counter-narrative videos. We distribute them all over the world. They're being used on four continents. Uh, they're be being used in madrasas, schools, by police, by um, prison rehab uh, uh, individuals. And they're being put on TV, on the internet. We ourselves have distributed them on Facebook. We did a study where we were able to identify ISIS supporters in English and in Albanian on Facebook. We found them by hashtags, and then we tagged them with our, our counter-narrative video. And I should mention that when we put one of our counter-narrative videos up on YouTube, you can find our YouTube channel. It's ICSVE on YouTube. That's the initials of our center. And um, when we, when we um, tag them with our counter-narrative videos, the name looks like an ISIS video. The thumbnail looks like an ISIS video because when we take these interviews, a two-hour interview, we cut it down to about two to four minutes. And we have a speaker speaking and we blur their face. That could be boring. So you have to illustrate what he speaks about. And what we decided is to go to ISIS's own propaganda and take from their video to illustrate what he's speaking about, but to switch it on them, to show a frame of disgust, uh, a frame of horror with what they're doing as the speaker talks. So when we tagged ISIS supporters on Facebook with these videos, they thought they were ISIS videos. And that's the whole idea, to, to reach the people that are already consuming ISIS materials and hopefully entice them into consuming our videos. So we don't name it expert counter-narrative video. We name it, uh, well, the one I'm gonna show you is called The Rewards of Joining the Islamic State. It's a questionable title, right? You don't know what kind of rewards. But maybe the best thing is to show you. And I should just say on Facebook, when we uh, tagged ISIS supporters, ISIS distributors, we were amazed that they redistributed our films. They allowed them into uh, channels. We've also dropped them into Telegram channels. They allowed them into closed channels where it was uh, an ISIS uh, reverberating chamber, echo chamber. And uh, because they thought that they were their own videos, they allowed them in. Of course, we got cursed later. And um, it's dangerous work, but we've decided that it's important work. And it's not the whole story. It's a tool in the toolbox. And I totally agree with the speakers before me who said good governance is the real answer. But this is one tool, so I'll show it to you. Everything we do is free. It's for you to use. You can go to YouTube. Um, if you want it in your language, just let us know. We'll do our best to get it for you subtitled in your language. Right now our videos are subtitled in about 20 languages. So if you can play the video, and this one is uh, just hot off the press. Uh, the video editor finished it last night. It's a guy in Baghdad prison. فهو كنت على مشكلة واعتقلوني عائلية يعني عشائرية شون بين عشيرة وعشيرة فصار بيها دم واعتقلوني يعني فعن طريق هذا الشغل أكوالة اسم زياد انت ميت وياه من طلعت قال لي طينا رقمك نعم هو كان تم تنظيم الآن نعم طيت رقم طلع رقمي للتنظيم البرة يخابروني وقالت حقوقي صير وياه ترى أنا 
بانه نفسي بانه هون اعتقلوني وانا شفت البريء وما عندي شيء بهاي السالفه السجون متاذيت وتاذوا عائلتي بانه دفعوا محامي واصدقائي هم اللي كانوا وياي بهاي الشغله كلهم تنازلوا عنهم وطلعوهم بس انا ما تنازلوا عنهم بانه شيء يعني يعني شيء سني او هم ذاك ولا شيء كلهم تنازلوا عليهم وطلعوا بس انا ما تنازلوا عني بانه اشتغلوا وياهم بعد خمس عبوات ناس في خمس عبوات واحده على السيد احمد بلا دروس واحده على اركان سعود الجوزه كانوا مصدر للقوات الامنيه وقالوا تحط له عبوات بالباب مالته شخص إلى عمر قالوا لهم بالعصا لا بالسيارة هاي خليت شخص إلى أبو سلام منتسب بالقوات الأمنية بالمنطقة داخل المنطقة بالباب مالته خامسة منطقة حي العصري بالأدروس ديالة قالوا هذا بيت مال الضابط بالباب مالته مو هاي العلاقة هي بس تحطها وتنسحب وتدق على هذا الرقم تفكير كل يوم بين صار عليهم شيء فثاني يوم الصبح دريت بين أنا بيت بين هم مقتول وبالخوف بينه إذا حد ما تشر راح تحاسب إيش راح يصير عليه يعني أنا إيش راح يصير ما يصير بينه أنا قتلت هذا البشر لا خايف من الله ما خايف من الله من الله عز وجل من خمسة طقيت قتل بها طفل الخامسة قبل يجي قبل بس يعني ببالي بينه طفل هسه وين راح هذا شنو حاله أنا إيش راح يصير حالي طفل قتل ولد بس شيء ما انقهر عليه وترجى بانه يسامحني حتى لو ما واصل بانه متوقع بانه يسامحني هو الطفل هذا بريء يعني من هاي الشغله وانا يعني احس بنفسي بانه انا طبيت السجن شيء قتل هذا الطفل اتعب بالنوم مالتي واتعذب به لان تعبان يلا انا اختنق مره اقعد ارقان وقبل وقع بنفسي بانه اعتقلت شيء لانه ظلم هذا الطفل ما بالبيت اعتقلوني انتقل بيت انتقل اي بس اسمع صوت ما شفته اي يعني تعيط وش عده هو ما مسوي شيء شنو شنو مسوي هو افتقد بكل شيء انا صار سنتين يعني مو مواجه ولا شايفه ما عندي لا رقم موبايل بينه خابرهم او اتصل عليهم يعني او يجوني على المدة يواجهوني ما حصلت بكل شيء انتميت للتنظيم انا ما ادري تصير دوله سنيه وانا اثار نفسي انتميت للتنظيم وصار العكس علي بينه اعتقلوني هاي طبت للسجن اللي طرحت حياته الاخرى بانه قتلت طفل وذهب الى الجحيم بس ادعى الله عز وجل ان يغفر لي الذنب اللي انا سويته انا ما راح يعني ما صب ما سوى كل شيء بل يؤدي الى الاسوء سو ثانك يو اند اي ام هابي تو توك وذ اني اوف يو ليتر ثانك يو ان فور فيري فيري فاين ادريس اند اي ثينك ذا فيديو واز فيري فيري very very moving and touching too uh, now may i request uh, mr vladimir um, and reef for your address please thank you <clears throat> mr chairperson esteemed participants to the conference ladies and gentlemen I would like to thank, first of all, the organizers of this forum for their kind invitation and for the possibility uh, offered to me to take part in your discussions, which I know are held traditionally in this format at a very high political and professional level. I admit that in Russia, especially within the professional community of counter-terrorist uh, experts, we have followed previous editions of the conference closely and with a lot of interest. And I have a strong feeling that Russia will seek even more actively the chance to come here again next time and to continue exchange of views on important issues with, with such a remarkable uh, audience. I hope that I and the other Russian colleague from the Minister of Defense, who also flew from Moscow to join you, and he will speak a bit later. I hope that we will contribute in an appropriate and useful way uh, to the success of our collective work here. Just a couple of words uh, about myself. I'm deputy director of the Russian Foreign Ministry's Department on New Challenges and Threats, which since July 2001 deals with the diplomatic aspects of Russia's participation in the international cooperation in the field of countering terrorism and certain other related global threats, which are um, extremism, narcotics, corruption, sea piracy, but mostly counter-terrorism. 
I do not think that anyone in this room would argue with me if I say that terrorism is not just a global threat today, but that it is uh, growing. That is very important. Growing despite active and more and more systemic uh, efforts, counterterrorism measures taken at international and national levels. Terrorism is becoming more dangerous, more aggressive, and more effective. I will indicate just the most evident signs of this highly worrying uh, international trend. All of these signs are well known to you, I have no doubt. First of all, in the recent years, international terrorism has obtained new and unprecedented deadly qualities. It has shown that it is capable to gain large territories, establish a quasi-state regime on these territories, it has also shown that it is strong and knowledgeable militarily enough to conduct full-scale and prolonged military campaigns, real wars against professional armies, even against several of such armies. Terrorist leaders and their ideologues continue to increase their almost universal ideological activities. They continue to improve their propaganda and recruiting skills, including through the most effective use of information technologies, but also possibly through the use of some other technologies which uh, permit to manipulate hearts and minds of the large masses of people and of concrete individuals, transforming them into the so-called lone wolves of terrorism. And we know now that sudden and extreme radicalization of individuals, especially those without any personal history of radicalism or crime, has already become a very powerful terrorist weapon nowadays. And this weapon can be used practically anywhere and at any time. Such individuals radicalized to terrorism can become suicide bombers or use cars or kitchen knives or axes against civilians in the street in any city but they also can think about, eventually, about using some more sophisticated and dangerous tools and equipment, chemi chemical, biological, nuclear even. And no law enforcement or special service would be there in time to stop them. Today's global terrorism in un is unprecedentedly aggressive and it never seeks compromises. It never makes deals, even with the elders or seniors of their own religion, tribe, or community, or with the other radicals who choose less aggressive tactics. The modern global terrorism is extremely murderous, and it always wants to show it, to make out of the mass murders it commits a demonstration, a show. And these appalling and monstrous demonstrations amazingly do their propaganda and recruiting job. They contribute to the popularity of terrorists, they do not work against them like it would have been the case a couple of decades ago, even 10 years ago. Another very important aspect of the modern global terrorism is that it infiltrates and uses for its criminal and subversive purposes any conflict, internal or international. Practically any significant social, economic, religious or ideological injustice and injustices, we have them, plenty of them in our not so ideal world. Terrorists succeed in these operations and provocations because they are very active, as I said, and skillful in the information space. And they know how to sell the most simplistic solutions to the people who really suffer and who are often ready to trust whoever promises fast and clear result, justice in brackets, of course. We all know that this is the way towards further exacerbation of any of these conflicts or injustices. What I have just said, how I have described modern global terrorism, and I have not enumerated all the facets of the terrorist scourge, should ideally be enough to make us all, all states and all societies come together and act together against terrorism and win in the fight against terrorism because terrorists and the radicals were always and are today just a small portion of our societies. And we, 
good people, normal people, peace-loving people, are the absolute majority. And we are stronger and we are better in any possible way. And what is also very important, we know theoretically what to do and how to proceed in our fight against terrorism, in our collective effort. The UN has always worked, has already worked out all the necessary plans, strategies and decisions related to counterterrorism and continue to do so every day. Uh, 19 universal conventions and protocols on various aspects of, of the fight against terrorism. Probably I should add to, to this list the uh, draft uh, comprehensive convention on international terrorism, the draft launched by India long time ago, but it's still on the table and it has a lot of uh, brilliant ideas which, is, which are to be concluded and finalized. Also, we have the unique global counter-terrorist uh, counter-terrorism strategy of 2006, a Bible of collective counter-terrorism. More than 50 uh, UN Security Council resolutions, excellent documents, including those adopted under obligatory Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. They deal with the most topical matters of the international anti-terrorist cooperation, curbing terrorist propaganda, banning weapons for terrorists, protecting civil aviation, suppressing the activities of the foreign terrorist fighters, including FTF's returnees. All these documents and decisions create a formidable foundation for effective and swift and real counter-terrorism partnership, for a true worldwide coalition or a unified front against terrorism, as Mr. Putin, our president, Russian president, suggested uh, in the General Assembly of the UN in 2015. If just one third, maybe less, of these UN decisions were implemented, there would not be any global terrorism in the world at all. Terrorist activities would have been reduced long ago to sporadic and less and less frequent occasions for individual country level or even local community level police-led operations. Instead, we have what we have, a huge monster I have described at the beginning, a highly dangerous and continuously mutating, unpredictable and always murderous threat for everyone, for every country and for every citizen of this country, of any country. So then my, the question is, what went wrong and what goes wrong with us united to combat terrorism? For Russia, the answer to this question is quite clear. Some of the terrorist leaders in the past and probably now were and are people of extraordinary capabilities, organizational, military, financial, criminal, or others. But on their own, without some amount of support provided in the right moment by, let me say, outside allies, including states, state structures, maybe indirectly, or in the form of turning blind eye on some specific developments related to terrorism and threatening some other country and not your country. On their own, without this support, terrorists wouldn't be ever capable of anything even remotely, remotely close to what ISIL was doing in 2013, 2015 in Iraq or Syria, for example. It seems that since the very beginning of the era of the modern global terrorism, all the people say that this era started in 2001, but although Russia met the most embattled squads of this then new category of terrorists 10 years earlier than that in the 1990s in the Northern Caucasus. But with, from the very start of this era of the modern global terrorism, a rather important group of countries, including those who play the leading roles in the world affairs, the Western countries, have never put in their political agenda counter-terrorism cooperation above their other political and geopolitical priorities. On the contrary, in Chechnya, and before that in Afghanistan, and after that in the Middle East, it seems that our Western partners were and are prepared to, to play 
or to deal with terrorists, to use terrorists to destabilize or to dismantle regimes considered rock or authoritarian or dictatorial. The names can be different. The essence is the same. This dealing with terrorists is a very dangerous game which always ends badly sooner or later. The most obvious example of the catastrophic developments in Iraq after 2003, in Libya in 2011, and later and now in Syria, geopolitically and to a certain extent ideologically motivated interference in the internal affairs of sovereign states, the use of terrorists and extremists to overthrow legitimate governments to destroy traditional systems of security creates chaos in which radicals and their sponsors seek to gain political as well as economic benefits. But these benefits are nothing compared to the, to the suffering of the people of the destroyed country or of the destabilized entire region. More, these benefits mean nothing compared to the damage it all causes to the anti-terrorist security of the world community, including the Western countries and themselves. That is why global terrorism grows now and no one can say today what it will be tomorrow, what will be its dimension or priority targets or means to act, to use in their ter terrorist activities. It is high time we reconsider policies and start implementing the UN decisions for real, extraditing or prosecuting all the terrorists extraditing or prosecuting. Stop terrorist propaganda through probably rather dramatic and strong measures in the uh, media space, information space. Maybe measures close to censorship. Stop using double standards and dividing terrorists into different categories, bad ones and not so bad ones. Now it's very popular to call them violent extremism. To launch a, a, a concept of preventing violent extremists or countering violent extremists, which is dangerous. Terrorists should be terrorists. I would like to conclude with a specific comment. We are hearing a lot these days at international forums about the plans and practices of preventing and countering violent extremism, PVE, CVE. Russia remains very skeptical about this concept since its launch at the Washington summit in February 2015. We still do not have a definition of violent extremism. Please be careful when you use this notion. It is just a rather vague description. Our academics insist that violent extremism is just terrorism. Or on the other hand, there is pure and simple extremism, often not related to violence, but always dangerous to states and societies and people, because ex extremism, even not violent, means aggression against legitimate authorities and fundamental systems of a state or society, including traditions, religions, values, way of life. Together with our like-minded countries, we have put all these formulations we believe in dealing with extremism in our new Treaty, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Convention on Countering Extremism, signed in June of last year by the heads of state and government of all six SCO member countries. With India and Pakistan joining the SCO, I hope the convention will gain support and authority, will be implemented much more widely and effectively. The treaty is open for non-SCO countries, and in any case, it could be an example of how to deal with the issue of ex extremism. Returning to the concept of CVE, PVE, in the key documents of the concept, we think we see a monumental mistake. It is not stipulated clearly and specially that states and their competent structures play the primary role in any work to counter extremism, internally or within the framework of international cooperation. Some of the elements of the concept, on the contrary, suppose that international best practices may be introduced in a sovereign country through direct contacts of some international civil society, 
with local communities or local civil society institutions without proper clearance on the part of the government. We see this as a potentially another scenario of interference into the internal affairs of sovereign state, which given the delicate character of the issues of ter terrorism and extremism can become a serious factor of destabilization and provoke a rise of extremism. I would conclude here. Thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, Vladimir. I think you brought across some very, very relevant points. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, may I request uh, General Atta's name for his uh, address, please. Good morning. Time limit about 15 to 17 minutes. Thank you. Good morning and uh, Jai Hind. Welcome to all our guests from the friendly countries all over the world. And my compliments to all those who preceded me here. Some extremely interesting and very articulate presentations. I particularly would like to compliment Salman Shishti Saab for his presentation, which was, I thought, extremely revealing. Uh, I am going to conduct, uh, I'm going to conduct this talk of mine almost like a, like a syndicate lecture at the Staff College of the Indian Army. You know, you'll find slides here and things like that. Uh, usually, last four years that I have been involved with this, with this particular extremely fine conference, um, I've always spoken um, without slides, but I felt this year it's about time that on an issue such as terrorism, we came to some more specifics and allowed my audience to also relate to the specifics that which I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk to you a lot about uh, um, a very wide canvas on new terrorism. And at the end, I will have one slide to talk a little about India itself in particular, but that's the focus for us, and South Asia, Kashmir in particular. So, I hope I can change slides from here. Yeah. Right. Uh, there's no need to define terrorism. I know we are not going to basics. We are not at uh, kindergarten school. But remember, even the United Nations has no definition of terrorism. So it's worth... Just looking at two definitions which I pick, picked out for you and looking at a couple of issues in that. The first one, which is from the U.S. Department of Defense, a few very catchy words in it, is intended to coerce or to intimidate governments or societies in the pursuit of goals that are generally political, religious, or ideological. So the issue of ideological with, with terrorism, the connect comes there. The second one, if you see, very interesting again, it aims, the third, fourth line, it aims to induce a state of fear in the victim that is ruthless and does not conform with humanitarian rules. Publicity is an essential factor. So these are find yeah. three groups of people who are involved, prevalent in the practice of terrorism around the world. The first are state actors. Uh, if you want to identify states around the world, and we'll all have our political differences in identifying such states. But the second one, non-state actors, we are all aware of. And the third, which we as in India are particularly aware of, is the state-sponsored non-state actors. Which means those who have the, the, the full backing of a particular state and are fighting a virtual proxy war in your country, in, your, in, in a particular region. So is there a date for uh, new terrorism? Uh, many, many scholars say yes, 9-11 is, is a particular date, a cutoff date in black and white. I would always like to leave that vague because if you really see the advent of technology through the 90s, the coming of the, of, of the net age, 
connectivity, etc. It's, it's not something which has happened overnight. It's a, it's a, it was a transcending trend over a period of time. 9-11, of course, gave it that major effect. For us in India, it could very well be 13-12, what happened in the attack on the Parliament House. It could very well be 26-11. But between 13-12 and 26-11, lots of things happened in India. Many, many terrorist attacks took place, which could all be counted as a part of new terrorism. What is the new age terrorism? What are the kind of, what are the kind of actions? Bloodier, more go in it, suicide attacks, suicide bombings, nothing different. IEDs and car bombs, lone wolves is something which has entered into it recently in the last four or five years. Unconventional vehicles of kinetic energy, particularly UAVs, is something that we are looking at in the future. Trucks which have already been used in Europe, aircraft which has already been used in 9-11. Very interesting knife attacks, China. In China, Kunming, where you found uh, the Uyghur attacks, 27, 28 people died in a matter of a couple of minutes in a knife attack by terrorists at the Kunming railway station. And you find even gas attacks taking place. Uh, the threat of nuclear terror is something which is always hanging on our heads. But I would say atomic demolition munitions, ADMs as they are called, although the threat remains alive, but technologically we have not reached that stage where you find the ability to carry miniature ADMs from point one to point A to point B is within the capabilities of terrorists yet. That technology has not come to them yet, although there's a tremendous amount of nuclear talent which is still prevalent in the world after the breakup of the former Soviet Union, but mercifully, this has not yet happened. The other issue is, after 9-11, the very debatable issue, is there a restraint on the intensity or the size of attacks to keep these below the threshold. Uh, this is a very interesting aspect to debate because after, we have not had a 9-11 kind of an attack after 9-11. You've had big attacks, but not something like that. Is it because of the response of the United States, the complete international security assistance force in Afghanistan, perhaps even of, after Iraq? Was it, was it because of that that we have still found a threshold? In the case of the Indian context, you will particularly find that there has been a threshold an attempt to keep a threshold. That threshold has sometimes been threatened. It happened with 1312, the attack on parliament and Operation Parakram took place after that. It happened with 2611. It happened with the Uri attack, which led to the surgical strikes subsequently. So sometimes you find that these restraints do go overboard. Uh, what aids New Age terrorism? That's, that's an interesting aspect, and there will be a lot on the slide for you to read, but I will only, only draw your attention to one or two things. I think the second bullet, the first two bullets are the most important, the first being radical beliefs and ideology, which is assembly, particularly the aspect of hate groups. It's hate groups which drive this, this complete New Age terrorism. And the means of information and communications, the smartphones, internet, black net, Black net you're aware of, even if you may switch off the internet anywhere, the black net still seems to be available. You have satellite coverage. Um, need, needn't remind you of what happened in Mumbai 2611 with uh, David Headley, with how the manner in which he came and did his reconnaissance off the map, off on ground and off the maps. Then, of course, there are more lethal means of destruction, a resort to unconventional methods of all kinds, easier training today, and a transnational nature of the whole uh, much more transnational in nature today because of the kind of connectivity which, we, which you have. The type of targets partially changed, seem to be less political, and what we are finding, in particularly in Europe, you found uh, the, the targets were more uh, collections of, uh, of human beings together, airports, uh, uh, stadia, tourist centers, institutions. In Pakistan, you have found particularly the attack on the army public school, which left 142 people, young children, dead. Which is one of the most dastardly attacks that we've seen in New Age terrorism. Uh, the, one of the most important things which aids New Age terrorism is financial networks. And who can better understand them than, than in India? You found for many, many years in the state of Kashmir, we used to always talk about uh, the power of financial networks and how it was aiding the whole thing. Mercifully, last year, a very fine decision taken by the government of India that we, the NIA finally went after the financial networks. And that has, to a very large extent, 
put a paralysis, for example, on stone throwing, on many other activities which are uh, uh, quasi-terrorist or involved with terrorism as such. Um, yeah. Exploiting the internet is an interesting aspect and social media platforms. You're all aware of everyone has got a smartphone with them and how, how social media is being used for this. Uh, it enables 24-7 uh, networking all the time. VOIP, which is something which has not been yet been uh, broken. The Skype has yet, yet to be broken. Uh, generation of recruitment through chat rooms. Motivation and passion, which comes tremendously out of generation of new ideas. And uh, you have uh, training and literature. You had, for example, the Dabiq magazine of, of the ISIS, Daesh, which did a tremendous amount of motivation for people, young people, foreign fighters, who came and joined the ISIS at that particular time. Uh, some major basic observations about all this. No lone wolf attacks cannot, to my mind, cannot make as much of a political impact as uh, group attacks. And what 9-11 did, a lone wolf attack is extremely difficult for it to achieve that kind of a thing. Terrorists today are far more educated, there's no doubt about it, no, no, no great knowledge on that. Although transnational in nature, it is the homegrown terror which is acquiring much greater prominence. And in India, you've seen this in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, after fighting, after having uh, almost 20 years of dominance by the foreign terrorists, you're suddenly finding uh, local terrorists emerging. And uh, that is primarily also a lot to do with the arrival of the new generation, a new technologically empowered generation, much more ability to network, make use of smartphones and things like that. Uh, defeating Defeating suicide attacks has become much more difficult. And uh, the only thing that you can achieve is damage limitation in this. Why do I say this? You have seen the return of suicide attacks in Kashmir in the recent past, and I'll talk about it subsequently in the next two minutes. What you require today to resist new world, new, new age terrorism is more resilience to withstand it, not just stamina by itself. So the last bit, um, how, do you, how do you overcome this? How do you defeat this? You have to target the root. And for targeting the root, you have to start from human ideological mapping, which is required trans, in a transnational mode, not just in a national mode. You have to understand cultural terrain. And you found the United States Armed Forces took 10 years from 2001 when they went into Afghanistan to 2011 when they actually realized that without the understanding of cultural terrain, you cannot fight terrorism. And that is a, one of the most important lessons which emerged from there. Subsequently, counter narratives for disaffected populations, a lot about that has been spoken in the morning. Institutions and centers of potential recruitment have to be targeted. Um, when I say this, I always talk about jails. I talk about labor camps. And I'm so glad that the government of India has finally gone after the central jail in Jammu and Kashmir. The center of, I would say, it was the center of the place where everything used to happen. And we used to always keep pointing it out and no one would take action against it. Um, anticipating new lines of attack, preventing the rebound of defeated terrorists. The question I was asking uh, the, my good general from Nigeria this morning. Uh, how, how do we intend to defeat the uh, Daesh? Daesh has been defeated, we say, but it's still in a networked state. So how, do we, how are we going to finally defeat it? And I think some of the extremely fine model which exists uh, is, is in Singapore, which is a very, very small state. I won't go into the details of it, but it offers a very, very good model of counter-radicalization and, and defeating terrorism. Targeting the means, uh, last bit, targeting the means, I would say, just a, one or two things out of it. Control of financial networks is one of the very, very important aspects of it. This is essentially a vulnerability-based analysis or not a capability analysis, which I'm doing for you. But you have to remember that physical security, the last second last bullet, physical security is a very essential aspect. We are realizing this more and more in India. We are finding that our garrisons of the Indian Army are all extremely vulnerable without having wire obstacles, without having walls. We, don't, we can't somehow prevent these attacks. There are many, many other things, smarter border and coast management and more intrusiveness. You have to prevent loss of privacy and rights have to be overcome and things like that. These are all generally known. A issue, creating a culture of security and compliance, 
and awareness, that is the essential thing, and one of the most important things, political cooling of potential zones. You see, you can keep talking about uh, Syria and Iraq, unless Syria cools down, unless Iraq cools down, the possibility of uh, ensuring the non-resurgence of Daesh or ISIS um, it, it will always remain uh, very, very suspect. So the last slide of mine, is there a new age terrorism in Kashmir? I thought this would be of interest to our, to our, to my audience here. I'd like to remind you that uh, Kashmir is one of the rare areas where you've never had suicide bombings. There were only three suicide bombings in Kashmir as far as I can remember. One at the, or almost two at the, at the gate of Badami Bagh, one on the, on the bus of 19 Infantry Division at Patan, and one more, which I can't really recall, there were four such bombings. That was the past, 2004. After that, there's been no bombing. There have been suicide attacks. There's a lot of difference between suicide attacks and suicide bombing. Just remember that. Uh, what you're seeing is a, is a return of the, what is called the so-called. I call it the so-called fedain, because a lot of people take objection to the word fedain. So-called fedain, suicide terror. We have found a re-entry of this. Ever since 2016, you're finding a re-entry of it. And I wrote an article of this also in the national media. I did make a warning that we should not think in restrict our thinking in our mind that Fidain or so-called suicide attacks can only take place in Jammu and Kashmir or in Jammu or in northern Punjab. It can very well take place in any part of northern India. Uh, of course, increase in the local content, as I've already brought out in South Kashmir, the effective use of the black net and the network with a huge amount of use of the smart technology. Financial networks, which have proliferated, but mercifully now brought under control. I hope this control continues and a tremendous amount of emphasis on information and psychological operations emanating from across the line of control, which is having a huge effect on the population, on the alienation aspects, which for which we need to find answers. And this is one of the very important aspects in, in countering New Age terrorism, where you may counter radicalization, you may counter um, you may de-radicalize people, but the continuous emphasis and efforts of your adversaries on psychological operations and information operations, you have to find answers for that. Because if you do not have a system in place, one-time de-radicalization and counter-radicalization is going to, be, to prove completely counterproductive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jai Hind. Um. Uh, thank you, Atta. I think that was very, very uh, brilliantly put. Uh, now uh, we will open the field for the interactive session. We have about 15 minutes. Uh, before that, I just got uh, one small uh, point to give. Uh, when we speak of a definition uh, of terrorism, per se, which has not yet been done by the world body, uh, we must also understand that while the world body has not defined what terrorism is, it has defined what is the terrorist act. And uh, that, along with various other initiatives which have been taken by the United Nations, forms an effective piece of legislation for the world body to act to fight against terror. Uh, now we throw it open to the House. Uh, can we be brief and uh, 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 please indicate your, uh, your name and institution? Yes, sir. Uh, get, the mic, get the mic forward, please. No, no uh, uh, here, I'll, I'll come to you after that. Uh, please also indicate to whom your question is addressed. Yes, go ahead. I think I'll be audible to you. No, no, um, you have to be audible to the audience also. Yes. Thank you, General, for a very useful uh, PPT presentation. Hello. My question is, jihadis of Pakistan may not be able to gain, you know, nuclear weapons, but jihadi mentality obsessed in Pakistan army getting, you know, these nuclear weapons. What is the possibility of that? Thank you. I'll, I'll take it. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, the officer there. So my question, I'm Mohit Malhotra from the National Defense College. Question is towards General Atta Asnain, sir. Uh, uh, sir, Brian Jenkins said some time ago that terrorists want a lot of people watching but not a lot of people dead. And uh, as we discussed New Age terrorism, you did say about the non-state actors from where the threat lies now, more amorphous, more diffuse, no hierarchical structures, operating in cells which are not linked to each other, so difficult to target. So now maybe the argument is that they want a lot of people watching and also a lot of people dead. And the, and the, 
the cap on the violence is gone now. So you did give certain options on how do you counter it. So in this response strategy is, is one of the responses which I didn't see covered was is to discredit the leadership. By examples I would give, let's say, discrediting of uh, Guzman in Peru or, or, say, or bringing out that, maybe the jurist bringing out that Osama bin Laden's fatwa, death to America is not legal under Islamic Sharia law. So what about the discrediting of the leadership and the ideology itself? Maybe I would like to have some comments from you on that, please. Uh, we'll take one more question in this round. Yeah, right at the end. Before you. Yep. If it's for you, then you have to. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I'm Rajkumar from uh, CDTI BPRND, sir. My question to Shai Syed Atta and Sain, sir. Sir, the terrorists or uh, extremists, they are taking the advantage of the Quran by saying the name of Allah and uh, so we have to brainwarming the public by the religion so that the terrorist activities can be reduced uh, through religion. We have to brainwarming them. This is my question, sir. Right, thank thank you. you, sir. Uh, for the second question, what exactly is it that you want him to answer? How do you, how do you discredit it, the legitimacy of an ideology by targeting the leadership and how would you do it in, in case of such terrorist groups? How do you target Baghdadi's ideology? How do you target Bin Laden's ideology? How do you target it? And uh, for the third question, the specific question, please. No, no, the one which was already asked, what, what, what do you want to ask? Only one question, sir. That means uh, through religion, we have to bring the public, the people, so that uh, they're, they're reduced, the uh, terrorism and extremists, sir. We can reduce them through religion. Come, Atta. As all three Thank you, sir. to you, you just take it on. You may like to give your comments after that. Uh, uh, uh. Thank you. Can you hear me at the back? Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, fine. Uh, sir, your question. Interesting aspect of, uh, a very specific aspect of new age terrorism. Proxy support ideological support coming from external, uh, from an external entity, something like the Pakistan army. Of course, that's a very specific instance itself, but I will, I will, I will attempt to answer that. Uh, I don't think you can counter um, a, an, an entity as powerful, as strong, and independent as the Pakistan army. It is wishful thinking that you can counter it like that. But yes, if you have a very strong psychological warfare capability within you. You have a very strong information warfare capability within you, wherein you can defeat the propaganda machinery, you can defeat the information machinery of your adversary. I think you can achieve your aim very largely. But this is something, it just doesn't happen overnight. You require tremendous talent. You require, um, as I said, understanding of the cultural terrain. And this is something that we have missed out in as in our own, in our, in our own context, uh, in, a, in a state like Jammu and Kashmir, where most of us actually have no, uh, not have that kind of an idea which we need to have. Pakistan, well, we are aware today that Pakistan is doing a very deep study on, uh, uh, they have enough academics with them, they have very young people with them, they're doing a tremendous amount of study of the internet, or uh, instances of males, etc., to understand the psyche and work on the psyche. This is something of the model in which the United States Armed Forces have been working for quite some time. We, unfortunately, have not adopted this so far. Because our concept of counter-terrorism has been more physical. The second part of it has emphasized on de-radicalization and counter-radicalization, which by itself is not alone, is not sufficient. What you need is to finally defeat your adversary in the domain which he's trying to 
dominate you. He is dominating you in the physical domain. You are defeating him there. Now dominating you in the psychological domain, in the information domain. That's the point area which you really need to work on much more. Now the issue regarding, uh, let me come to the last question first and I'll come to your very interesting question. On the aspect of using religion to defeat uh, radicalism. I, I thought uh, uh, Salman Chishti Sahib spoke about this uh, in the previous session uh, in, in, in a fair, fair amount of length. You see, within the religion, you will always, within a faith, you will have a lunatic fringe, a very strong radical uh, fringe, and you will have a very large moderate fringe, very strong moderate fringe. I was just giving the example to uh, uh, Chishti Sahib himself, that in the year 2004, I visited Jordan, and I happened to meet uh, the king of Jordan there in a visit, and he gave me a copy of the Amman message, in 2004. It's a beautiful message if you read it. It's all about the empowerment of the moderate street within a faith, within the faith of Islam. What surprised me, it took 14 years for that message to come to India. 2018 is only Prime Minister Modi when he invited King Abdullah and, that, and they gelled together. The Prime Minister understood what message the King can actually give. And you had a huge gathering at the Vigyan Bhavan where we both Chishti Saab and I were present there and it was an amazing message which was sent out but not sufficient. I don't think the publicity was sufficient even after that. What we need to do is to send home this message hugely. There is a lack of energy among those who are working on using religion as a counter to radicalization itself. I, I, I think uh, I quoted this, the Singapore model only a half a minute on that. The Singapore model is a question of networking of a number of moderate imams. They are called the internet imams. 75 of them who are networked together to bring home the message of, moderate, of moderation and faith to people who are essentially the vulnerable elements of society like prisons, uh, labor camps, colleges and universities, wherever you have large gatherings of male population. I hope that satisfies your, your question. Uh, the last part, the last one, ideology, I thought I broadly answered your question in the contents which I answered the, second, the, the third question. But the aspect of ideology, defeating ideology, a radical ideology is only through empowering and strengthening moderate ideology. There is no other way to do it. Unfortunately, you have a silent street, you have a silent majority in every place where you will find a radical content. In Kashmir, you will find this. It's a question of scratching the surface and finding where that moderate street is. Half the time, we have the problem of being able to go out and search for that moderate street and empowering them. I hope that answers your question. Right. Uh, we'll have the second round of questions. I'll come to you first there. Yep. I'll come to you after this. Namaste, sir. Uh, from the topic, new is terrorism. My question belongs to maritime security and threat. As I work in a merchant navy, Sir, from 2009 to till then now, so many seafarers and shipping companies are facing problem in Somalian coast, in Gulf of Aden, and west coast of Nigeria. And very big amount of money involved in all this process. And all this money are going to sponsors to terrorist organization in North Africa and Middle East. So my question is, sir, how can we counter it and the security in all the ships? from fire hoses to the increasing of war naval ships, still ships are hijacked by the uh, pirates. So how can we protect them and yeah, make a safe it. selling to all the ships? Thank, Thank you. you. And would you like to take this off? A little. Yeah, we'll have the second question now. There. Oh. Oh, we'll take two questions and I'll get you on. Yeah. This, uh, <coughs> Terrorism, which has been influenced by religion as such. The counter narrative, as uh, this Chisti Sahib also told, Makkah and Medina, all over the world, from the people get together there. Can there be a narrative flowing out, moderate narrative, influencing across? Because I feel that country wise tackling it will be a fractured uh, kind of a response. From Makkah, Medina, some kind of, some kind of thought process to moderately communicate 
and disperse it all across the world, that distortion, distorted version of the religion is not the answer to taking ahead the cause. Thank you. Any more? Uh, yeah, right at the end. Uh, sir, my name is Ashwat Komat. I'm from South Asian University. And my question is on the definitional problem of uh, terrorism. The last meeting that was conducted to discuss, this, uh, to discuss the Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism was way back in 2013, after which it just stopped. Uh, my question here would be, is it now important to define terrorism? Are we doing fine without an actual definition? Or do you feel that it, it, needs, to, it needs to be revived, the whole thing again? And I think my question would be more directed towards uh, the deputy director from uh, Russia. Thank you. Thank you. Right. And? I, I guess I would just, uh, I don't want to discuss the financing so much because that's not my area, but the counter narratives, of course we have to understand uh, states are behind a lot of this and there's uh, proxy wars going on. ISIS guys told us that they opened uh, beautiful packages of out of the cellophane, took weapons out of cellophane, brand new, and tons of money was pouring in. We know a lot about the borders with Syria, and I don't want to name countries, and uh, I know others would name my country, but, you know, of course there's um, these big powers playing, and of course there's religion used in the ideologies, but what I would say is uh, we want to promote moderation, we want to promote moderate messages, but we've learned over the years that a cognitive argument is not enough, that terrorists are very adept at using emotions. They use pictures, like you saw in the video, this picture of this little child. Uh, a picture of a dead child can move you to action. And terrorists are also very contextual. They will go down to the area wherever you're they're aiming for and find out what are the local issues, what's, what's harming people in that area, how are the youth alienated, marginalized, discriminated against, angry, and they will use those things to motivate them along with emotions. So we have to do the same. We have to reach them on the internet the same ways, using the social media platforms as effectively as they do. Do you know if there's a ISIS video out and you like it, I can contact you. If I'm ISIS, I can find you. I can say, would you like to come to Raqqa? Do you want to get married? Well, how about our videos? Why aren't we doing the same thing? Contacting people, talking to them, pulling them in, engaging with them. The terrorist groups groom people very carefully. They find that, that vulnerable individual and they, they move with him. So we have to be as clever as they are in using emotions, in using the internet, and in addressing local grievances. Oh, I'll, I'll get to you later. Yes, it works. Uh, I will make several points. Uh, first of all, in response to the um, practically very last question about definitions. To tell you the truth, uh, within the expert community, we know uh, on counterterrorism, we know that there, there are uh, several definitions uh, in the UN documents, several definitions of terrorism. Uh, Convention on the Financing of Terrorism, 1999, Article Number 2, and also um, more recent resolution of the Security Council, UN Security Council 1566, operational paragraph two, which describes very specifically, the resolution was adopted after London bombings, terrorist bombings in 2005. Uh, so yes, that's uh, the definition which is there. So uh, problems with the fighting, uh, with fighting terrorism is not exactly about definitions. Uh, we, we understand quite clearly what we are confronted with. So it's, once again, it's about political will, about the priority of uh, counter-terrorist uh, issues uh, compared to other geopolitical or political uh, priorities. But the, uh, everything theoretically is there, it's done, it's formulated. UN works and worked very fine and very useful 
uh, it work, its work was. Um, so it's not about definitions, it's about something else. And uh, uh, we should, uh, but at the same time, definitions are very important. For example, they are, uh, it's important to know them uh, just to discuss matters we're discussing now. For example, um, in one of the uh, interventions, I saw state terrorism. There is no state terrorism. Terrorism, well, from the formal diplomatic point of view, it's uh, something perpetrated by non-state actors. And states, yes, unfortunately, they sometimes use different ways to support this or that grouping to achieve their political or geopolitical aims. But state terrorism, it's something else. When states behave badly, it's, those are, there are other notions to use to describe these state activities. Um, I, I just seize this opportunity to, to talk a little bit about religion and in all the UN documents, it's a mantra. Uh, Security Council resolutions, all the conventions, any declaration issued uh, at the UN level, uh, every time we confirm that religion or nationality or whatever, but religion also has nothing to do with terrorism, has nothing to do with terrorism. This is one of the main principles of any internationally accepted, adopted decision. Um, countering ideology. Yes, of course, we should show films, we should involve, engage religious authoritative leaders but governments and states and state structures, educational state institutions should play the leading role in this. And also what should be done are uh, government activities to curb the spread of terrorist ideas through films, through uh, videos, through uh, internet and social media, and probably measures should be taken uh, which are more aggressive, more strict. I said this in my, uh, in my speech, but probably my English is too Russian to... So I would like to, to, to repeat this. States have the, primarily, uh, the primary responsibility, the leading role to play in countering ideology, the spread, including, including from technical point of view. Of course, those technical decisions and measures should be based on uh, laws, on laws introduced, and they're being introduced in Russia, but believe me, in Europe, in France, and in Germany, the laws are even stricter than ours in blocking terrorist sites, and of course there are problems about the freedom of internet, this principle of freedom of speech, and uh, other freedoms, but we have to deal with this issue, including not through uh, business companies which deal with internet, but also through uh, government, government measures and interstate, intergovernmental cooperation. That's the way forward. And finally, of course, religious leaders, including in Russia, they, are, they have the role to play in countering terrorist narratives, propaganda, ideology. When we speak about moderates, uh, being involved in these efforts, uh, yes, but probably these moderates should be more aggressive in what they're doing to counter bad ideas spread under the camouflage of the great religion, which is Islam. So these moderates probably should be more dynamic, aggressive, uh, probably aggressive is not the right word, but more dynamic and more uh, concentrated on the task. In Russia, for example, yes, we are doing this and we are involving in uh, state strategies, state programs, leaders, uh, authoritative leaders of, of Islam. Islam is part of Russia. It's, it's, we have 20 millions and they are just Russians. They are not uh, newcomers to our society. But even, even in Russia, in this situation, we understand that they are not doing um, good Good, good job uh, aggressively enough. They're still uh, leaving too much space for radicals who have their agenda, who have uh, beautifully, wonderfully prepared uh, notions to use. That's why I, I, I said in my speech that 
it's very close to some kind of technology of manipulation of uh, people's minds and hearts, including through videos of uh, killed children or which are not killed uh, by, I don't know, Russian army or Syrian army. They use these met methods and they use these met methods brilliantly and ma much more effectively than, than us. We have to be in this field more effective than them. But it's one, of the, one part of, of, of the job. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll just take a minute only to respond to that brilliant question on the, on the symbolism of Mecca and Medina. My response to you, a typical Indian Army kind of a response in three bullets. Number one, geopolitics. Number two, sincerity. Number three, energy. Geopolitics, until you overcome the problem of geopolitics of, of the Middle East, Iran versus Saudi Arabia, this, this kind of a messaging will always have problems, it will always be strewn with problems in the sectarian, on the sectarian side. So you need to overcome this. We are happy that someone like Mohammed bin Salman today, MBS, is doing something in Saudi Arabia. I hope there is a culmination to his efforts and this effort should not remain, should not become insincere on the part of the people who are working for him. Subsequently, we want to see a much more moderate Saudi Arabia probably emerging beyond this. Sincerity. The aspect, you can't have Dioband giving a message once in 2011, once in 2016. This message has to be every day. It has to be every, every morning. It has to be every evening. It is this messaging. You see, how do you defeat a narrative? By making your narrative stronger. If you, if you are going to make your narrative only once in five years, who's going to listen to you? So the last part, energy. I think in the entire movement, the counter-radicalization movement and the movement of the moderates, there needs to be an infusion of energy. There needs to be needs to be number of young people, someone like Salman Shachi Saab probably, who can lead these kind of things and take it beyond. Otherwise, I don't see any, any chances of this kind of a thing succeeding. Uh, thank you. Uh, that... Thank you. I think that brings us to the end of the session. I'll just very briefly sum up in the next uh, one minute or so, just three points I would like to give. Uh, first, when we are looking at the ideological content of any of these conflicts, if you have to defeat that ideology, it is my personal view that you require an alternate ideology. And if you want that alternate ideology to defeat the ideology which you are trying to counter, then you have to make that alternate ideology work. As far as the definition part of it is concerned, I'm totally with uh, uh, Andreev here. Uh, the lack of a definition, while a definition may be an ideal situation, the lack of a definition cannot or has not actually restricted, uh, let us say specifically in India, uh, the Indian armed forces or any organ of the Indian state in fighting terrorism. So while a definition may be ideal, I don't think that a lack of a definition has been an hindrance. Uh, finally, uh, when we talk of Mecca, Medina and uh, this thing, we must also remember that the uh, Wahhabi Salafism has been promoted by Saudi Arabia throughout the world. I really do not think that they will try to put out an alternate narrative there. With this, um, may I request all of you to join me in a very warm round of applause to Atta and, and Vladimir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President, Chair for an informative and thought-provoking session on the trends of New Age terrorism. May I request the Chair to facilitate the speakers, please? Ms. Anne Speckard. <laughs> Mr. Vladimir Andreev. Lieutenant General Saeed Atta Hasnain. I request Sri Chandra Vadwa to, fe to felicitate the Chair, Major General Dhruv Katoj.
Thank you all. I would now like to invite everyone to join us for lunch. We will reconvene again at 2 p.m. for the special keynote session.